What's up, noobs? This concept of virtual land feels both really new and really familiar to me. So I figured I'd take you along on my valuation exercise as I applied the techniques I've used to analyze over a billion dollars in New York City real estate to see if parcels in Decentraland are currently fairly valued. I picked Decentraland because it's one of the more established metaverses right now, and it's the first one that I signed up for. Typically, when I study a new real estate market, it takes me at least a month to understand the lay of the land and make some good local connections. But luckily for you guys, it's been over a month since I started looking into this stuff and talking to some experts, so you won't have to sit through my learning curve. So let's go on a quick tour of some hotspots. The highest density location is probably Genesis Plaza, because that's where you start when you create an account, and it has a bunch of marquees showing upcoming events. By the way, I don't have a fancy graphics card that can handle Decentraland in all its glory, so I leave this warning message on every time I log in to remind me that I'm virtually poor. And I dress the part too. Here's my avatar, a skeptical metaverse noob in overalls with flip-flops and a man bun. Outside of Genesis Plaza, we can find where the crowds are by looking at the map, and most of them like to hang out in the casinos in Vegas City, which is really indicative of the speculative nature of this place. There's also this area called the Wonder Zone where you can mine for items that you can turn into NFTs that can be sold for mana. So that's why all these people are here grazing like cows. I also found a small crowd in this area, which turned out to be an Iranian art exhibition showcasing a new crypto platform called Xcoino. It's a good reminder of how global and multicultural the metaverse is. Not that Web2 isn't, but when you can visualize and hear other users, it creates a sense of community, and that's a huge part of its value and potential. But like I mentioned in my previous video, the valuation is probably pricing in all that potential and then some. So in this video, we're gonna analyze the shit out of Decentraland parcels using traditional real estate valuation methods and one non-real estate metric. Let's see what happens. Looking at those earlier clips, you'd think Decentraland is a pretty hopping place, but those were the most crowded places I could find. The fact is, Decentraland doesn't actually have a whole lot of people in it. One of the Decentraland co-founders recently stated that monthly active users are around 300,000, which averages to a few hundred people an hour, and if they're only spending, say, 10 or 20 minutes on here, that's just a few dozen people at any given time unless a major event is going on. And you know what? That's about all I saw every time I went in. So let's first take a look at a non-real estate metric that's more common common in tech startups. What is the market valuating each of Decentraland's monthly active users at? We could look at the current market cap of MANA, which as of this filming is $6 billion, divided by the MAU, and that's $20,000 a head. But how do we put that in context? Facebook is prepping to launch Meta, and its market cap as of this filming is $919 billion, and they have 2.9 billion users, so $316 per user. In fact, most of the big tech companies have a value of $50 to $400 per user. You might hate Mark Zuckerberg and Meta almost definitely will not be decentralized, but are you willing to pay 63 times more than Meta by investing in mana or land? This is a terrible sign for Decentraland so far. Chuck one up for insanely overvalued. But what if you compare the monthly active users to real land values with respect to population? 300,000 monthly active users is the virtual equivalent of the population of Buffalo, New York, and I stared at a lot of upstate land this past summer. It's where you go to get away from people. If we hop over to Zillow, by the way, f you Zillow, I still hate you. We can see that the lowest priced land there is 7,900 for 3,500 square feet or $2.27 per square foot. If you buy a few acres of land, it's even cheaper per square foot. Meanwhile, the lowest priced parcel in Decentraland right now is 4,350 mana, which is somewhere between 13 and 20,000 US dollars because I swear every time I research this stuff, it swings by a few thousand a day and the lowest priced parcel goes up by 50 to 100 mana. Anyway, a parcel is 16 by 16 meters, which is 172 square feet. So it's anywhere from $75 to $115 a square foot. That's knuckin' futz for how sparse this population is. Chalk up another point for overvalued. Or is it? Another angle to look at is that Manhattan has a density of 69,000 residents per square mile. Throw in tourists and commuters, and the number of daily active users jumps up to nearly 200,000 square miles during the day. Decentraland has 18,000 daily active users across 90,000 parcels that are 172 square feet each, totaling a little over half a square mile. So its density is actually over 32,000 people per square mile, which isn't more than Manhattan, but would probably place it around fourth or fifth most dense county in America. Also, $115 a square foot is less than 10 times lower than Manhattan prices. And with continued user growth, it might surpass Manhattan. So is Decentraland actually cheap? Maybe. Huh. Chalk up one point for undervalued. Let's look at it from more angles. I'm gonna try doing a comp study, which is one of three valuation methods a real estate appraiser would use. The other two being cash flow analysis and replacement value, which I'll get to later. A comp study pegs the valuation of a parcel at the average of a bunch of similar parcels with maybe some minor adjustments due to different features. And in a market with high volume, 
Comp studies can override other valuation methods because, hey, if someone's willing to pay those prices, then that's technically what it's worth. I suspect a disproportionate amount of buying and selling activity happens at the lowest price parcel. And from what I've seen, the lowest price parcel changes every day. It's highly liquid, which is great for evaluation exercise. So let's study the area around the lowest price parcel. That particular parcel is also significant because we could use it as a floor for the valuation of all parcels in Decentraland at that particular time. By the way, I just want to make the clarification that lowest price doesn't necessarily mean it's cheap. Cheap implies that the valuation is low, regardless of the price. The lowest price is kind of like if you check NASDAQ level 2 quotes on a stock, you'll see all the bid orders way below the price and all the ask orders way above the price, but the actual trading happens where the two meet. This is different from real world real estate because usually the lowest price parcel is in a neighborhood that's in a location or has something wrong with it or has limited upside potential. And this is a good time to point out that location doesn't carry as much weight as it does in the real world because you can teleport freely around the map and the draw distances aren't further than a few parcels. There's supposedly a premium for being next to a road, but since most land is undeveloped and sparse, I haven't even walked on a road yet. But that premium might be justified later if people put buildings up on all the parcels and you have to start walking in between the alleys. So that's probably why the lowest price land is in these clusters of lots of minimum sized parcels with no roads in sight. But still, with the ability to teleport, roads just aren't even that important. Time will tell whether small neighborhoods will develop their own character and create value from there. So let's take a look at some of these listings and see what they're asking and what prices they've traded at before. Instead of making you go through all these listings, I'll save you the time and just show you the data I compiled across 10 single parcels clustered around the lowest price listing. I looked at way more than just these 10, but I wanted to analyze the specific cluster. As I suspected, there is a hotbed of activity in this region, and all the parcels have traded at least once in the last week. Some flipping for more in just one day. But then you've got this one parcel that just traded for 4,350 mana on December 15th, and it's now asking 100,000 mana or 377,000 US dollars. Probably not getting that price anytime soon, and it shows that the asking prices don't necessarily dictate the value. But I think this is currently a seller's market, and single parcels are clearly trading in the below 4,000 range and continues to creep up every day. Now, if we explore some bigger lots like this one made of four parcels next to Dragon land, we see a pie in the sky asking price of 60,000 mana or 15,000 mana per parcel. And the selling point is that it's got great views of the district. Whatever. With my graphics processor, I'm not impressed by the views anywhere here. But it last traded at the beginning of the pandemic on March 19th, 2020 for more mana than they're asking now. That shows you how volatile this stuff is because there's three layers of assets constantly fluctuating. The land value, which we're trying to establish in this video, the mana to Ethereum conversion rate, and the Ethereum to US dollar conversion Rate. I skipped a step and just converted mana to US dollars, and it shows that the owner originally bought this one for $2,000 just a little bit cheaper than the $226,000 they're asking now. An 11,000% return is not too bad for a whole period under two years. Real world real estate generates like a thousand times X less than this parcel. These alternative investments is one of the reasons why I had so much trouble fundraising this summer. Let's take a look at another four parcel lot over here called Ethermon. It's asking a pie in the sky price of 150,000 mana or 566,000 US dollars. And the seller bought it all the way back in July of 2019 for 90,001 mana but mana was only four cents back then, so the owner only paid $3,800 for it. If they get their ask, they'll make a healthy 14,000% return. So comps have shown us how much variance there is in pricing, and that aside from the lowest priced single lots, there isn't clear market consensus on what the value per parcel is. Sellers can ask for more and claim that being next to something justifies the price, but there isn't much to back that reasoning up. So for that reason, I've got to chalk up another one for overvalued. It is pretty clear that having more parcels on your lot comes with some premium though, because with a large larger lot, you can build bigger buildings, invite more people, and generate more value out of the space, just like owning all the properties of the same color in Monopoly. The next most valid justification for selling at a significant premium is if you've established that the digital structure you've built generates some real world value or utility. And now we can explore the other two real estate valuation methods, replacement value and cash flow analysis. This is another area where metaverses diverge from real world real estate. Development costs are a whole lot cheaper in the metaverse. You still might have to pay an architect who understands the building code, which is like 10 lines in Decentraland versus 4,000 pages in the NYC zoning code. But once you have a design, there's no construction cost or plan approvals or inspections. You could also just download someone else's building and plop it in your site. But if you develop a game on your lot, there's a whole lot more software development costs involved and that's a very unique cost. So the replacement value valuation method can play a factor, but it's hard to peg a standard pricing on the work that goes into it. What's more important is whether you've given users stuff to do and reasons to conduct commerce. Landowners are experimenting all the time and iterating through models that generate real world value. 
And that's where the cash flow valuation method can come in handy. If a virtual parcel can reliably generate steady income, as the market matures, it'll start to settle on a cap rate and all of these valuation methods will really start to converge to the same number. But I had a lot of trouble finding sites generating steady income. The lots generating the most buzz right now are the ones backed by a real world brand with lots of resources. So their virtual presence is a marketing extension first and a metaverse investment second, if they even care about that aspect. Sotheby's did a virtual gallery and auction recently, and there's tons of galleries displaying and selling NFTs right now. Some parcels have rentable billboard space meant to take advantage of the proximity factor. But again, you've got to be really close to a popular venue to generate regular income through ads like that. The cash flow valuation method is actually pretty inconclusive right now because there's just not enough precedent yet, and landowners are experimenting with new use cases daily. So it's gonna take quite some time before this market matures, and that's why until then, speculators are just throwing crazy asking prices to see if there's any takers. And the long-term buyers are really betting on their ability to eventually monetize or hope that their neighbors attract lots of users or that mana and land prices keep skyrocketing. So I still can't peg a good value on this and I really gotta just chalk up a few more points in the overvalued column. There's one other qualitative factor. I'm admittedly getting on the bandwagon late and the fact that I'm making this video now after Bitcoin has already gone through two huge bubbles is indicative of two things. One, I'm old as and slow to adopt these days. And my birthday's next month, so give me some subs and likes. And two, if an older millennial like me is finally catching wind of what's going on, it's too f late. The days of making a thousand X on a parcel here are most likely behind us, and the bubble might be deflating already while the capital flows to new metaverses. My overall conclusion is that most of the asking prices in Decentraland are grossly overvalued, and the market will take a lot more maturing, and the use cases need to be much more established before the lowest price parcels are really justified for what they're asking. But in until then, even though a lot of the trading activity is happening at that level, there's not really a lot of stability backing the value behind it. That being said, I will be doing another video on some investment strategies for virtual land that I will employ whenever I do decide to pull the trigger on a parcel somewhere. If it's already out by the time you're watching, it's right here. Till then, stay curious noobs.